Calvary Raid Valley family. I uh, want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm going to be here for maybe one minute. We'll give it one minute and let some people just uh, tag along. Hope you guys are having a blessed Wednesday and have had a blessed week. I know that um, we finally have gotten some rain out here in Northern Ireland after like two weeks of absolutely no rain which was quite nice, but for the farmers, they needed some rain, but the Lord brought it. But anyway, um, interesting times still we're living in, but I'm, I'm quite enjoying the time that we have, um, just uh, being able to relax and uh, do things that we love to do, like cooking. We've been eating so much here at the 65, um, so it's been quite nice, so it's been quite nice, yeah. If you're wondering, we're going to be in Psalms 84, going up to the book of Psalms, same book we've been going through on Wednesdays for the past year, and man, it has been a blessing, because it is so thick with God's promises, um, and so many other uh, um, rich uh, words that we get from the Lord um, in it, through people's lives, and that's what we'll be looking at today. So, wait a couple more seconds, then we'll get started. It's just background music, because we're just waiting, so you can have something to listen to. Yeah. Alright, I'll put the guitar down, and we will get started. Oh, the hindi or bossa nova. No, the after. After? Oh. Yes. Alrighty. Again, thank you guys so much for tuning in to, oh, they got a hair in my mouth, to the Bible study on Wednesday. Psalms. 84 is what we will be going through. Um, oh, I do have something. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yes, where do I start? Yes, Psalms 84. Everybody's turned? Awesome. We're having our service here, both online and here around me. So it's quite, it's quite nice. Uh, I love how close the church has been able, our church, Calvary Bay Valley, has been able to come together a lot closer through this COVID-19 time. We meet up at 10 a.m., which if you guys are watching and you guys um, aren't part of it, you guys can. You guys are more than welcome to join us at 10 a.m. We have a devotional. Every single morning we get a little bit of the Old Testament and a little bit of the New Testament. And it's just a great way to come together, to pray for each other for the things that lie ahead in our days, and to just read God's Word. We don't... We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but we just allow the Word of God to speak for itself. Mm. We just, you know, take turns reading it. So if you'd like to join, um, you can pop a comment and say, I'd like to join. And we can message you on direct message on Facebook, the password. Monday so, through Saturday? Monday through Saturday, because on Sunday, we have church. church. And that's technically another, that's, that's, that's a whole meal we have there. <laughs> but... Anyway, without further ado, Psalms 84. Now, we'll just read through it, and then we'll get into it. And it says this. To the choir master, according to the Gittith, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh Sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it, a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand years elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked 
of wickedness. For the Lord God, excuse me, is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. I'm just going to pray real quick. Lord, thank you for giving us another day to experience life with you. I want to invite you into this time that we're going to have, Lord. You say when two or more are gathered in your name that you are there in the midst. Lord, that's a promise to take to heart. Lord, I pray that you are near to my brothers and sisters that are tuning in. I pray that you highlight your word, Lord, and just show us uh, what you want us to take from it tonight, Lord. I pray that I may decrease and that you may increase in this time, Lord. Thank you so much for your word, Lord. I ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Here we are. Another song, or a song, or a poem. There, there are many different things. They're just, uh, they're beautiful. I love them. They just fill me right up and just pull me straight, straight to Jesus all the time. I love the beginning. Even before the verses, the Lord uh, has something really cool that, 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 uh, that He showed me while studying. But this opens up, and this is written to a specific person, and that's the choir master. And we see the choir master, that title, about 55 times in, in, in the Psalms, and it's quite consistent. And it's pretty much, uh, the choir master came from the line of the Levites, the priesthood, um, the, the Levite tribe out of, you know, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, they were specifically chosen to be the priests, so the ones to, 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 to make the sacrifices, to carry the Ark of the Covenant, and do things like that in the temple. Now, the first one to hold the office of the choir master was Jeduthun, or his other name is Ethan, Jeduthun. And we find that in First Chronicles 16.41. Uh, this office is hereditary, so it pass on, you know, uh, down the bloodline and his two colleagues which wrote other psalms were Heman and Asaph and we find that in 2nd Chronicles 35 15 so we see that it's written to the choir master to a person and in past studies I even said that the choir master could even be God himself but I'm sure it was written to a specific person to the choir master of leading worship uh, for all of Israel now, it says, according to the Gittin. Now, this word is quite interesting. Let me tell you why. In the Hebrew, it has a feminine noun. You know, kind of like something like he. It'd be masculine, she, obviously feminine. Why I get to that? First of all, this instrument is an instrument. <laughs> it's an instrument. It's, uh, it was called the Gittite harp. It came from the area of Gath, which was... Philistine territory, Israel's enemy. Now, the reason in the beginning why I shared is an interesting fact um, that it has a feminine noun is because um, I guess the shape um, of the of this harp might have been feminine, kind of like a guitar. Kind of my guitar has like a, a curve to it. It'd be it'd be feminine, and so so people think that this is might be is just an interesting fact. It's you know. That this might be the start of the guitar. So that's why I add that. So this this gittit. So it's this this the psalm is played with this gittite harp from the Philistine territory, which how they got that, don't know. Maybe when they took over they they, they took one, don't know. But it is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Okay, who is Korah and who are Korah's sons? So Korah is the descendant of Esau. We know the story of Jacob and Esau. So Korah was part of the Levite tribe, but there's something interesting about Korah that happened. He led 250 men on kind of a, a, a rebellion against Moses and Aaron because they were choosing um, the Levite tribe to do specific things 
And to cut a really long story short, um, it was it was him going against what God had placed, what, what God had intended, what Moses and Aaron had placed. So what God did is he swallowed them up. So him and these 250 men that went against God's God's appointed rulers and you know against Moses and Aaron and against what they had they had set as a Levite um, tribe, he swallowed them up. But anyway, Korah's um, children didn't die. They weren't part of it. They stayed alive. And their names are the Korathites. Now, the sons of Korah are these. We find this in Exodus chapter 6, of verse 24. The names of the sons of Korah are Asir, Elkanah, and Abisaph are the three sons of Korah. So this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Now, when I was looking this up and saying, okay, who are these people? This, this, uh, this lady in, this, in, in the uh, source that I got it from Bible Study Tools, her name is Hope Bollinger. She came up with these, she had these three, this, these three points that comes out from the sons of Korah. Because it was like, who are these people? Because of this, it's like you're, we're, we're wondering why. Before I say, share these three points. That the sons of Korah, the, their descendants, their, their, their father had, um, had did something, you know, sinful. And in those days, if, you're, if your father or, or mother or, or brother did something, they would look at you like that. Like that was your identity. It's like, you're the father of that man that did that. But these are the three points because now we're reading that the son that his descendants now have look at scripture. We're reading it today. Now what do we get out of that? And this is where she brings this up. That family legacy doesn't determine everything. Going against God has consequences like Korah. He went against God and he died. And the third point was that God can redeem anything and anyone. And God brought redemption. Like we're reading scripture right here from this, from that very bloodline. So I thought that was really cool uh, thing that I thought I'd share for the start. That God can redeem anything and anyone the way he redeemed this bloodline. Um, so I love it. So without further ado, we will start with the first verse. It goes like this. Psalm of the Sons of Korah. He says, How lovely is your dwelling place. O Lord of hosts, how lovely, how beautiful he's saying. Now before I, I dive into to this, the name that the Lord has given is the Lord of hosts. This is what this means, the Lord of hosts. Host means a company, an army. It, it, this is what it means. All created things, all agencies, all forces, you know, angelic, are under the leadership or dominion of the Lord who made and maintained them. Now this is used to express, this, this name, Lord of Hosts, is used to explain, to express God's great power. You're going to see that he uses this name throughout the psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Then, in that time, there was a specific dwelling place where God was. He, that's where God's presence was. So that's what he's referring to. But what does that mean for us today? What's God's dwelling place today? Well, in the New Testament, the dwelling of God is in His people. It's in the believer. The dwelling of God is you and I. Now what does, now, you're so, okay, Ernie, what are you trying to mean? The dwelling place today of the Lord is His church, is the church, it's us. That's God's dwelling place. He says, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Amazing. So he points out that for us today, because it would have been different for him, a specific place, of worship but now you are a mobile carrier of God's very own spirit 
the Lord of hosts spirit dwells in you. He's saying, how lovely is it? The church. How beautiful is it? Now he says in verse 2, My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Switch. About that. So, now he's saying, for my soul. Now, the soul, I've, I've explained before what the soul was. And it's like, for the, for the Hebrews, they looked at it four different ways. They looked at the soul as, as the breath. That comes from Genesis. When God breathed in the breath of life into Adam and, and Eve. Uh, the soul also has to do with the personal life. Uh, the third is the individual life. Like ego. And the fourth is um, physical. So he says, pretty much he's saying, my whole being, everything I am, it's longing. He, he even goes on further to express that it faints, that he is earnestly longing and desiring for this specific thing. And he says, for the courts of the Lord. Now, I had a little bit of a, I don't know what to call it, not a mix up, but because he's talking about the courts of the Lord, the courts meaning like, kind of like a courtyard, you walk into the courtyard, but it could also be the, the court where where um, we see like uh, in the in the Old Testament that Mount Zion where where the temple was 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 where a place where justice and judgment were played out. So he says, "I'm longing for your courts, for this place where you were where you dwell." Almost like he's longing for the church, for fellowship with his people, with 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 God and his people. Um, but I wanted to add something to that, to him longing for the courts. Because like I said, that's where a place also where justice and judgment were played out. And he goes on to say in verse 2 that my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Why is he singing uh, for joy to the living God? Well, with the courts, with justice, in the Old Testament, Moses had gotten... Um, advice from his father-in-law that because Moses had all these millions of people to look after and he couldn't take care of all the problems that they had so he appointed people he appointed judges he uh, pretty much started the judicial system he appointed tens fifties hundreds uh, and thousands and so the this justice system worked like this it was very just the way God set it up this was it. We find this in Deuteronomy and Numbers and in Exodus. All the different um, um, laws that were set forth. These are pretty much it in a, in a cram. No man deprived or shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. Two was two or three witnesses required to convict anyone. Three was punishment uh, not to be transferred. Four was a man's home was not to be touched. Uh, five was, um, if you were in, in enslavement, there had to be a point of liberty. Um, the next was uh, slavery with consent. So it's like being a bond servant. It's like you couldn't just be like forced into being a slave, like without, you had to consent to it. So he says here that my soul longs yes faints for the courts of the lord almost like god i kind of long for the place where your justice is played out where you are judge because i've i've pointed this out and this has been something that has been helping me pray for our church worldwide is that for many of our brothers and sisters is that god's justice and judgment is a is a is a big comfort for the persecuted church um you know, because if something's happening to them, they don't react and go into war. They say, God is going to take vengeance. He is going to be just. 
and almost like, Lord, I long for, for this justice. And because of who He is, the Lord of hosts, the, the creator of all things and the leader and, and, and uh, the leader of all the, all the an angel armies, all the nations of the world, that gives them a reason to sing for joy to the living God. That's beautiful. Then he goes on to say, um, quick, before I go on, I forgot that I had this. Because then I'll beat myself up if I don't say it later. What I pointed out so far is that the dwelling place is you. It's us. It's the church. And he's longing for this. And there's something so significant about this. And it points, and this is pointed out in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. If you guys want to flip with me. 242. 242. And it says this. Oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, this is the church. Yeah. And he says, remember what he says. How lovely is your dwelling place. Because something special happens in the gathering of the church. And this is it. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, God's dwelling place, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts. This is where we get the second verse. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I love that because it kind of goes hand in hand. Um... That he says, how lovely, almost like, how lovely is your church? And we see how important the church is uh, today. And we are that. So, verse 3 says, Even the sparrow mm. finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. So, now he paints us, a, it's great to have pictures, or it gets us, it, it, it explains divine, beautiful things. Jesus did that, and I'll explain that right now. He says, even the sparrow finds a home. The sparrow was a really small bird, and it had like a lifespan of three years. It was, it was nothing, it's really insignificant, kind of like us. But this really small, little, insignificant bird could even find a home. But what is home? It's a place of comfort. So even the bird could find a place of comfort in God's dwelling place. And it says, And the swallow a nest for herself. For, for herself. Mm -hmm. Even the swallow was kind of the same thing. It was a small bird with a little bit longer lifespan. Five, I mean, four, six years. Um, but the thing about this specific bird, and I like that the psalmist added this bird, is that this bird, every time it built a nest, it would return to the same nest. So it wouldn't create more nests, you know, every time it, it laid her young and then went off, it always made just one nest and returned to it, returned to it, because that's where maybe the, the, the bird found uh, peace and comfort and rest. And I love that he gives us that picture. You know, Jesus used the picture of, of, of birds in, in Matthew six twenty six, uh, where he says, like, I... I I feed the birds of the air, and I clothe the grass. And he says, how much more will I provide for you? And I love that he uses these pictures of these really it's a busy things to say, look, at, I love you even more than these things. And even these small things that I created, find comfort, find peace, and find rest in me. And it's like, it, it puts things into perspective that we are able to find a home and that we're, we are able to, to abide in the Lord. Just like 
the sparrow. It says, even the sparrow, even the swallow, where she may lay uh, her young at your altars, O Lord. So now, first it was a dwelling place. Now it's being more specific to the altar of uh, the O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. The altar was where the sacrifices were, were, were made. Uh, but he adds a little person, uh, not a, li a little, a big personal touch. He says, my king, he's making it my king and my God. Saying that, you know, a king was a chief ruler, supreme authority over a nation. But when it talks about, when you're talking to God about him being king, it, you're just pretty much saying that you are sovereign and you are the ruler of the universe. So he says, you're my king. And he says, and my God. That's where we the way, the way we get the word God is from the Hebrew word Elohim, which the primary idea of this name is that of strength and power, just describing the very character of who God is. So he adds that. He says, you, you're, you're my God. You're my king. I love that personal touch that he adds right there. So let's just make sure I'm not. So, so far, we see in, these, in this verse 3, we see comfort. We see peace and we see rest. Even the sparrow is able to fly here, find comfort, peace, and rest. God's dwelling place is the church. People that are astray, that are lost, you know, the Lord has chosen us to be conduits, to be the carriers of His very own Spirit. God's Church is, is lovely, as the psalmist explained. And even his own body faints for it. He's able to sing joy to the living God. I just want to flip, before we move on, to 1 Corinthians 12. 12? Yes. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. You guys like to flip there? You want me to flip it so you can see? Yes. Oh, there it is. Um, yes. Um, okay. So, let me recap real quick before I read this. That God's dwelling place, the church, is lovely. That's where God dwells in us. And that I like the picture that he puts that the sparrow and the swallow find home. And the swallow is able to find rest there. Now, let's read this. Just about the church. Of how important and how beautiful it is. Because it is Jesus' very own body. Living here. Right now. It says, verse 12. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized in one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. I'll just go on for a couple more verses. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would take it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Now I'm just going to flip down to verse 27 where it says, Now you are the body of Christ. Almost like you are the dwelling place of God and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church. And then he goes on. We'll stop there. I won't go into deep. I'm going to go into a rabbit hole. But you are the church. We're the dwelling place. And he says that even, you know, these small things are able to seek refuge. I love that. God has chosen us. Now, verse 4. See, before moving forward, we're going to see a threefold blessing. This is probably like the meat of the psalm. It says this, verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing praises. Blessed. Now, when we're talking to God, say, blessed is God. We're saying 
phrases to God. But when you're talking to a human, it's just, you know, blessed is he, it's meaning this, joyful is he, or oh, how happy is he. So let's read this again with that word in mind. Oh, how happy are those who dwell in your house, ever singing praises. This, check this out. There is a condition to this blessing. The condition to the blessing is that you must first dwell. Now, this, this word means this. Here's three different definitions. I love the first one. It means to sit down. The second is to remain or to abide. And we hear this word 400 times in the Bible. And I think it's because God's saying like, Hey, dwell in me. Sit down, remain, abide. John 15, 4. Church, if you guys like to, to, to turn to it, and if you're reading in, like to turn to it, so you guys can read it. I can read it for you, but let's read it together so you can see, because God's word is powerful. John chapter 15, verse 4. Yes, he says this. Remember, there's a condition to the, oh, how happy. This is the only way you're going to be happy. <laughs> it says, let's start off with verse 1. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now listen to this. He says, remember that word dwell means this abide. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Amen. So, there's the condition. What he's saying is, blessed are those who dwell in Jesus. Mm. Hey, we're here he's referring mm. to your house. Like I said in the Old Testament, it was a physical place. But now... We all have to do, all we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and we shall be saved. And he just says, just remain. Sit down. Remain in me. And you will be blessed. You'll be happy. <laughs> oh, how happy are those who dwell in your house, he says. Ever singing praises. So remember, the condition to the blessing is to sit down. Sit down and do what? Listen. To Jesus. Hear from Him. Read His Word. Abide in Him. Don't turn away from Him. Stay close to Him. And how do you stay close to Him? It says, ever singing praises. You praise Him and you acknowledge Him for who He is. Who is He? He's the Lord of hosts. He is the uh, creator and sustainer of everything that's around you. Amen. Now verse 5. We'll move on. It says, another blessing. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the highways to Zion. So we're going to reread that. Oh, how happy. Oh, how happy are those whose strength is in you. See, the thing is, is that everyone, no matter how strong you are, I know there's some strong-willed people out there. Everyone has a breaking point. Everyone, no matter how strong mentally or Physically, you are. Everyone has a breaking point. But he says, happy are those whose strength, the source of strength is. Second Corinthians, Paul speaking, makes a beautiful picture of this strength, of leaning upon and making God your strength. Now, if you guys would like, we can flip to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, so that you can be implanted into your head. God's word is rich. Let's read it together. <laughs> now, Paul says this. He says, remember, okay, before this happens, Paul just says that I've been shipwrecked, I've been, I've been bitten by a snake, I've almost been killed, all these different things, all these things that could have broke him. More things that probably, more things that have ever happened in my lifetime. And it produces this very word that is going to tell us how to seek this source of strength. How to, 
what the strength is. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient mm -hmm. for you, for my power is made perfect in this, in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My goodness. God's God's way of strength, of getting strength, is through a complete different way we would have ever thought. And it's through weakness. Where am I at here? Yes. So he says, so let me read that. So, blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highway. Now the heart is this. In simple terms, it's the operator of the human life. The heart takes us everywhere. It's just like, oh, well, I'm hungry. My heart's telling me I'm hungry, well, I'm hungry so I'm going to go do this. My heart's telling me to listen to this kind of music and do this. It's the operator of, of, of life. And, but the thing about the heart is that it's wicked in and of itself. But he said, whose heart are the highways to Zion? Naturally, our hearts aren't ways to Zion. Zion is pretty, is, is pretty much Jesus. You can put Jesus in front of Zion. as the dwelling place of God in Jerusalem. Where the temple was. And he says, whose heart. So this heart that has the highway to Zion could only be a highway through this. Through one being transformed, through one's heart being transformed through the finished work of Jesus. That is then able to bring glory to God. And able to be a conduit, a highway um, to Jesus essentially. So, praise the Lord. Remember, the, so, the, the blessing is only received when you rely on the Lord for your strength. So, reliance. Now, verse, verse 6 says, As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Okay. For these blessings, for us who, I can say I'm blessed. The Lord has blessed me abundantly. I'm sure the Lord has blessed you. But the thing is, is that hard times come to even the most blessed person on this world. Now, why do I say that? It's because this valley, Baca, this is, this is what it means. It means the valley of weeping. It was... A valley in the Palestine territory. Like I said, it meant the valley of weeping or of lamentation. Gloomy and dark. And there's this commentator that put this. He says, a valley through which pilgrims had to pass on their way to the sanctuary of, of Jehovah on Zion to God's dwelling place. Or it just may be figuratively speaking. Meaning that even... Even the, the most blessed person has to go through the valley. And I love what Acts 14.22 says. It says this. 14.22 Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now you say, well, if I'm blessed, well... Why do I have to go through this? But the psalmist says this, that this person that goes through the valley, that you who go through the valley of weeping, through the tribulation, they say that they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with its pools. So this thing that was meant to destroy you, this dry and weary place, because of you dwelling in the Lord, abiding in the Lord, because of you relying on the Lord's strength, this what valley of weeping can be transformed to be covered with pools of water. But that only comes through, through the abiding. It's like sometimes we're like, Lord, where are you? Well, not where are you in this, but this is a really hard thing. And trust me, there's really hard things, but we must turn to the Lord. And seek after Him. And look to Him. But 
Tribulation is part of life. Jesus says in this life you will have much tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Now verse 7, this is, this, this is like, puts this, puts like the cherry on the top for that past verse. It says this, it says that they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. The outcome of the abiding in the Lord and doing it together, like as a church, results in more strength. From strength to strength. And Isaiah 40, 31 puts a beautiful picture of what happens when we abide and trust in the Lord. And it says this, but they who wait, who abide in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm going to even go to 2 Peter verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 18. Peter 3.18. That's right. Okay. And for some reason, I keep uh, losing my place. Grace. No. 2 Peter 3.18. Okay, it says, but this. Remember, we're going from strength to strength. But there's specific ways, just like we saw in, in Isaiah. It is to wait. To wait on the Lord. To abide. He says this. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now to the day of eternity. Amen. But grow in grace and in the knowledge. And the only way we're able to grow in it is through abiding. Remaining in Jesus. Talking to Him on the day to day. Uh, reading His word. Because when those valleys of Baca, those valleys of weeping, we're going to come out the other end. Stronger than ever. And then, and the reason we keep flipping through all these scriptures is because one important thing that I keep um, um, uh, learning and one important thing that when you're reading scripture for yourself or doing a Bible study is to allow scripture to interpret scripture. So one important thing when you're reading the word, just allow the scripture to interpret. So look for another scripture that backs that up. So we'll move on. And it says this in verse 8. O Lord of hosts, remember the Lord of hosts, the host of all the angel armies, everything that's on the earth. Hear my prayer. Give ear, O God, of Jacob. He's just crying out. He says, Lord, listen. He's, sometimes we're scared to ask God to listen into our prayers. But Jesus said to ask. Matthew 7, 7. I'll flip there really quick. Matthew 7, 7 says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. And all he's doing right here, the psalmist, he says, Lord, hear my prayer. What a simple thing to ask for. Just listen to what I have to say. Give ear. Um, and he's calling out to the God of Jacob. Jacob is a patriarch. One of the, uh, we would say like the founding fathers of Israel. Uh, he was the son of Isaac, um, of the a nation we know now of Israel. And he's crying out. It was just like a last psalm that we went through. I said that it was a thing to call, to, to, to name someone. Um, uh, how do I explain it? Um, to refer to someone by someone. So it's like, oh, that's the God of Jacob. Oh, that's the son of Rick or stuff like that. You get what I mean? I kind of lost myself there. But he says, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. And then he goes on to say, in verse 9, he says, Behold, our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. Okay. For the, the shield then, it would have been a physical thing that the Israelites would have had to defend. Right now, I, I don't have a shield physically. But he says, this is what gives me the, the, the hint of why I can say what our shield is. He says, Behold, our shield, O God. 
looked on the face of your anointed. Okay, this was specifically referring to David, or Solomon at the time. But he's asking for, for favor, like, behold, look at this. Let's read it like this. Behold our shield, who is Jesus. Look on the face of your, of, of, look on the face of Jesus. So we can put Jesus into there. Because when we see the an, uh, uh, anointed, I mean, set apart, we can put Jesus there. So he says, behold, like my protector, O oh God, look on the face of Jesus. Almost like, look at me at this way, Lord. And he goes on to say, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. This is what he's saying. I like to always put like this. One day in heaven is better than spending any day in hell. And being a doorkeeper in the house of my God is almost saying like, Lord, I'd rather pick trash in heaven than to be in the, the tents of, of, of wickedness. I'd rather be the lowest of the low in your presence than be this, than, than, than to be apart from you. And I love this out. I remember meditating this a couple of years ago and said, man, Lord, just having the opportunity to know you and to be called a son is better than anything I can think of in this. Like, can you think of anything better than being in the presence of God? Than knowing that one day that you are going to be before him, before his dwelling place in eternity. And it's like, Sometimes we got to weigh what we have idolized in our life and say, is this better than being in the courts of the Lord? Is this better than dwelling and being with the Lord? 100% of the time, it's going to be a heck no. But dwelling, this is like, a, like a, a humble prayer. Lord, just knowing you is so much better than doing any of these other things. Being, low, being insignificant and small rather than being famous is way better. Just being right before you. And he says this in verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So there's a couple times in the Bible, I honestly didn't write down all the other times, where God is referred to as a sun. As, as a sun. Like S-U-N, not S-O-N. Um... Now, what is the sun? It's the power. It's the power source of light. That's how we get light. This is how we're able to have plants grow as a source of light. So it's like God is like essentially, you are the source of life. You're the you're you're um you're a sun and a shield. Now, I wrote down a couple of things of under under sun of God giving of of Jesus giving life. God's given life. And light through this, through grace, through hope, and through peace. And the way God is a shield for us is that God is just. God is provider. God is our protector. And God is our defender. So he says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing, no thing, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, what does that mean, walk uprightly? Well, we don't all walk uprightly all the time. But those who walk uprightly are the ones who have accepted Jesus into their heart. Where God looks at you and he says, oh, my, my son's blood covers him, so he's fine. He can enter in. Those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from you, believer. He has many things ahead of you, mainly being heaven. But God bestows favor. And he says, there's a one final blessing. This is the third blessing I was talking about. Three, four blessings. 
He says, O Lord of hosts, beautiful name, I love this one. Um, blessed is the one, O happy, O how happy is the one who trusts in you. Remember, these are conditional blessings. The condition is trust. Man, we don't always trust, do we? No. It's hard to sometimes. But uh, I was asking myself, I was like, man, Lord, what am I not trusting you with? You know, and I, and I thought of X, Y, and Z, and I said, Lord, simply like in prayer, I set these before you, and I trust you with these th with these things. But how happy is going to be the one that sets before their burdens, cast their burdens and their anxieties upon the feet of Jesus, and that person will be blessed. The person will be blessed whose strength is in God. When you don't rely on yourself, the key is, is don't trust in yourself, but trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, but lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. And oh, how happy are those who dwell, those who abide, stay close to Jesus. The three blessings, the oh, how happy is, if you're looking, if you're wondering, why am I so depressed? Well, let's look at this. Happy are going to be the ones who abide in Jesus. Happy are going to be the ones who rely on the Lord for their strength. And happy are going to be the ones who trust. It doesn't mean that we're always going to be smiling and every day is going to be good. But the Lord's going to bring you through it. Because as verse 7 says, they go from strength to strength. And the important thing is, is this, is that there's no kind of lone wolf Christianity because in the beginning he says, oh, how lovely is your dwelling place. And I believe that he is talking about the church. Is that we do these things together as a church, as the early church did, meeting together every single day, praying together, helping each other when they're in need. And we're going to go from strength to strength together. Amen? Amen. So, I'm going to pray. And... Um, Rick asked me to to play a song that I was that that um, that I that I wrote the other day, and it's interesting. It's gonna be co it's very different. It's a bossa nova style, uh, which is kind of a Brazilian jazz. Um, but I like to play it to you guys, and it's just this. I had I have no title um, to the song. Oh, yes. Okay. I have no. No title to the song, but the song is about is is like pretty much Jesus talking to you and says that I'm gonna carry you through the deep blue sea and I'm gonna carry you away from the burning flame through the trials and he says and I'm singing the song don't run away. I know that things are complicated, but don't run away. So let me pray and then I'll finish off with the song. Lord, I thank you so much for this word. For your word and even revealing to me Lord the importance of your church uh, Lord the the conditional blessings Lord they're not big to trust in you it is it's not a hard thing but we make it a hard thing Lord relying on you um, um, isn't a hard thing and trusting you isn't a hard thing they can be because we make them but Lord you are so you're so beautiful you're so amazing as the sons of Korah described you as the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. That you're over our governments mm -hmm. whom we look upon. You are uh, over our finances from which you provide. You are over our future because you're the one that holds it. So Lord, bless my brothers and sisters. I pray, O Holy Spirit, that you minister to them. I pray that you grant them peace, that you give them peace. And that you comfort them. And ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, here's it. Here's the song.
pray that you guys are blessed. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, you guys can direct message us. Or if you guys have any prayer requests, we would always love to pray for you. So send us your prayer requests. But we are having Sunday service as usual at 11 a.m. And we are going through the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 31, if I'm not mistaken. 33. 33. 33B. I was back. So 33, so we're almost done with the book of Deuteronomy. So tune in because it is an amazing book, just like the rest. God bless you.